All yours. Thank you, Peter. Thank you also, Felix, for the opportunity to present this research to colleagues at the school. Um, I chose this particular paper um, because I believe it's a good example of the kind of empirical work on the economics of well-being uh, uh, agenda that I'm working on, generally speaking. It's a kind of set of, it's a sets of big questions, but with, with um, an approach that's slightly different from how typically macroeconomists would kind of deal with it. So in this case, the bigger questions are about growth policy, bigger questions about the welfare cost of, 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 uh, um, of business cycles, but I'll be answering that or dealing with it in terms of well-being data, actual well-being data, rather than sort of utility or consumption data. So uh, it's a long title. I won't repeat it. Peter already did. Uh, but and there's also a number of uh, interesting scholars that join me on this particular piece. So uh, Femke de Keulenaar, George Ward, Bert van Landegem, uh, George Kvetsus, and Mike Norton. Um, and what's uh, and the paper is being uh, we're revising the paper at the moment for the review of economics and statistics. And so um, we'll be we plan to resubmit in the next few weeks. So any comments you have, please share them with me because hopefully we can still uh, we can actually still integrate them into the paper. Um, so uh, on the menu in the uh, next hour, hour and a half, potentially depending on, on, on discussion and questions, is the following. So I'll introduce and motivate the question that we're after, that we're really targeting in this case, and why we think it's important. Um, I'm going to introduce you briefly, and I hope it's not going to be too boring, to the three major data sets that we're using for this. Uh, so we're banking in on three big data sets. They're all three also very complementary to one another. The Gallup World Poll, the Eurobarometer, and the BRFSS. The basic results, so the headline results, and why these may be of interest to something that you may have come across called the Easterland Paradox, which deals with the long run implications of growth on well-being. So there's a paradox there, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit what that paradox currently stands for and how we think our results can actually help and try and explain the paradox to some extent, or at least provide uh, a new uh, a perspective on it. Um, discuss those. And then, um, if time permits, and I hope we do have uh, time for this, more additional results, more ro robustness checks, larger, uh, uh, larger um, regression analyses with more uh, variables, and a number of other um, uh, interpretations of well-being, such as positive and negative effect. And then comparing it also with the usual, a more macroeconomic approach to these kind of questions using household consumption uh, as, a, as, a, as a form of utility. And then the behavioral aspects around this uh, involving reference points. Um, okay, so that's on the menu. I hope you're, hope you're ready for it. Um, and so the, the question that we're after and that's really driving this research is a very specific question, but that we do think has a, a major policy implications and speaks importantly to a number of uh, uh, growing research agendas. And the question is, are people more sensitive to losses than to gains in economic growth? Now, we think this speaks to policy um, 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 priorities. Um, and what it will also remind you of is, of course, the, the Kahneman, the Kahneman and Tversky work on loss aversion. But it's important to distinguish that right away because it is very different um, in the sense that, as you will know, Kahneman and Tversky talk about prospective gains and losses and how they influence decision making today. Um, and they uh, look at this in, in, in the shape of utility. What we're after here is the actual experience, the immediate experience of losses and gains and how they may relate to one another. Uh, instead of prospective gains and losses. And the biggest difference, of course, with Kahneman and Tversky in this work is that this happens in a macro setting and also in an individual lab setting. Um, but obviously, the thinking behind this is, uh, is, is very much present, and you'll see how it will play out. I want to motivate the reason why we started asking this question in the first place. And I hope this will, uh, this will speak to you because it, it does get a lot of attention, this, this kind of um, uh, graph or work also in the popular press. And I'm sorry it feels so messy. It's because this, is, is this combines 156 countries. And so this is the Gallup World Poll data uh, and their li the life satisfaction measure, which is on the, um, the uh, vertical axis. And it runs from 0 to 10, no country has an average below three, no country has an average above eight out of 10 in terms of uh, uh, life satisfaction, the standard measure, uh, coming out of the Gallup World Poll. Um, and we map that onto, in this scatter plot, onto GDP per capita. And so there the usual suspects kind of stand out, the USA, Qatar, Luxembourg, Norway, you, you name it. Um, a number of things will stand out. And then for the economists amongst you, you'll recognize kind of diminishing marginal utility. But this is interesting here because it's diminishing marginal utility of money itself. 
um, or GDP per capita in this, in this particular instance. Um, and so this, this graph doesn't move very much every year. So people who are in this little subfield, like myself, for the past uh, sort of five, six, seven years, we've been tracking these data very closely to see whether there's movement. And typically we look at this in terms of movement upward. Is it possible to get countries further up in terms of well-being, and especially for the wealthier developed nations. So what we typically find is that it's very, very difficult, given these diminishing marginal utilities, to get countries further up. Now, why am I bringing this, this particular graph here on the screen? It's simply because when we were sitting in the Gallup offices, looking at this data, um, the first sort of data started coming out after the recession, so 2012, 2013, 2014, and something caught my eye, which is, that countries such as Greece and Portugal, like I'm trying to find it right here, Portugal and Greece, for example, are the ones who are suddenly kind of dropping like stones. So as hard as it is to get countries up on that curve, it didn't seem like it was very difficult to bring them down from the curve once you are entering recession territory. So growth seemed to not necessarily translate all that easily into further gains in well-being, but the opposite, the reverse, seemed not uh, difficult at all. And that is not a direction that most scholars or even policymakers or pundits typically tend to take. Um, and that's what got us thinking about, hey, wait a second. Is it what we're seeing here something called a, if you will, a loss aversion in a macroeconomic setting? And that's hence why we started asking that particular question I've just put on the board. Um, if we delve in, just for the sake of motivation again, to really show you this in a bit more action at a granular level, say take Greece, but I could have taken Portugal or Spain or someone else. If you look at Greece, um, so not in a cross-sectional uh, uh, setting, because I told you like we see this over time. Well, here, here you go. Here's the data over time for Greece in particular. What you'll see in the red line is GDP um, uh, adjusted for inflation goes up since the 80s to about to today. Uh, Greece has seen almost a doubling, but obviously lost about 20, 25% of that. The blue line is subjective well-being, life satisfaction is measured in the Eurobarometer since the 80s. And the point I'm trying to make here is that they've lost a hell of a lot of their GDP in actual terms, or in the past recession, but there's been a disproportionate, even larger loss in terms of well-being, right? So there doesn't seem to be much of a symmetry in the way that well-being and GDP kind of move, what you find is that a well-being has a disproportionate, uh, sorry, a loss in growth has a disproportionate impact on people's well-being above and beyond what you would expect from the usual kind of uh, GDP data. So this could start, this is I think sort of like anecdotal evidence or a motivation because it's, this seems particularly important. When the Financial Times picked up on this research when, it's, when it was still a working paper, as it still is, they call it the untold story of the recession because there's the economics that everybody talks about, but there's much also the kind of the psychological aspect that could potentially, and this would be follow-up research, be even more important in the long run because it could be lingering much more than when, so even when the GDP picks up again, say in the next four or five years, the psychological impact may actually linger. Um, so this is important. So well-being in Greece today is well below any historical record it has been for Greece since the uh, 80s. But GDP has lost 20, 25% and sits back at the level, say, 2001, 2002, which is still about 50% above where it sat in 1980. In a way, you find these subjective well-being measures becoming more and more used in research, and I'll get to the distinction with, with utility in a moment. Um, so you'll find very senior scholars like Deaton and Aguillon and, uh, and obviously Kahneman since the late 90s and early 2000s start using these self-reported <laughs> stated utility uh, in terms of well-being and using those data in, in um, in different measures. Um, interestingly, from the perspective of people working on this for the past five, six years, is that you found Ben Bernanke in one of his very last speeches actually making, uh, or making, the, uh, the, making the important note in one of these uh, keynote speeches that uh, ultimately economics, of course, ought to be uh, an, about understanding and promoting the enhancement of well-being. I do note the of course, because I think for economists it's not so obvious to be using well-being as such so stated preferences around well-being and more moving towards ut utility, utils, which remains much more conceptual and difficult to grasp. There are three, uh, and I'll try and go through this relatively quickly, but I think there's three literatures that um, this question and the, the results that I'll be showing you after that actually speak to. And the most obvious one is within the economics of well-being, the large literature about the relationship between income and well-being. That has always been sort of the most, uh, the, the question that's been driving this, 
uh, and getting much attention and driving this particular literature. And so um, there is consensus on the cross-sectional relationship. So the picture that I showed you earlier uh, that shows that diminishing marginal utility, there is no question, there's huge consensus on the fact that there is a, essentially a log linear relationship, a diminishing marginal util utility there. But where there is no consensus in the literature is on the time series. Most agree that in the short run, it fluctuates up and, up and down with, in line with economic uh, progress. So economics go up, well-being tend to go up, et cetera, et cetera. But where there is no consensus is in the long run. Um, folks like Justin Wolfers and his wife Betsy Stevenson and a few others are arguing very strongly that in the long run, there is upward trend in developed nations with, uh, as economics goes up. But Easterlin himself is always coming back, and a number of others too, saying that no, um, there's measurement errors here. If you look at big full cycles in the long run, look at 20, 30 years, you'll find that in developed nations, there's hardly any movement. Um, so even though in the short run it fluctuates, somehow, hence the paradox, in the long run, these short movements don't translate into long run uh, uh, improvements in well-being, notwithstanding increases in GDP. Um, and so that's where, kind of the, that's where we sit in this, in this debate, and so we think that we, we may uh, be able to help uh, explain some of these dynamics. In the macroeconomics of well-being literature, there's uh, already some work on the impact of the recession on well-being. So Angus Deaton has a, a 2012 uh, paper on showing that the financial crisis in the US directly impacted people's well-being. It's perhaps relatively intuitive and shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. And there's other work in that, in that regard. But none of these studies has actually kind of split up uh, income gains and income losses. So either they've looked at the re impact of the recession, so nothing but negatives on well-being, or they've looked at growth as such, lumping together positive and negative growth, even though that may sound a bit counterintuitive semantically speaking. So no, no study within using subjective well-being life satisfaction has actually sort of looked and compared gains versus losses. Uh, and that's a pity, we think, because it, it, would have, it would have shed more light on a number of things. This obviously speaks also to the, the welfare cost of business cycles, because I would argue it contradicts, uh, it sort of it goes against the, the traditional way of, of evaluating this. Um, and then uh, there is obviously um, uh, moving from decision utility to experience utility is, is a, is plays a role there. But let me um, go straight to the data, given that this is, after all, an empirical question. Um, and so you've got the Gallup World Poll, um, to which I have access as an advisor to Gallup. And so it's over a million observations. They send out, it's an incredible effort. They, it's cost them over $150 million by now to, do the, to, to recruit this data set. It's, um, since 2005, they sent teams to survey representative samples across the world. So 156 countries uh, are, are, are they per, uh, participate, and over, well over a million by now. Um, and, but the important thing is so the average response to the life satisfaction question, which is one item in the larger battery of surveys that they ask around the world, uh, average response is 5.52 uh, out of 10. Um, but uh, interestingly to me is so the, the, we link this with the World Bank GDP measures and the average growth in this time series is, uh, is 2.68. But, and this is important of course for the intuition behind our work, is that we just not just look at the 815 country years of growth, we split them up in the, 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 the negative and the positive. So we will look at the 170 negative growth uh, country years, where the average is minus 2.9, and compare those with how the relationship plays out with the positive growth, where the average growth is actually 4.09 for 645 uh, uh, country years. Um, so about essentially, when you think about it, one in four years is negative growth. I just want to raise this because as soon as we talk about growth or, you, or in a paper title or in a data set or in a regression, we think growth and we conjure up semantically positive growth expansion. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that one in four of your data points is negative. And so what you'll find here is that the empirics will show that it's that one in four, the negative, the recession years, are the ones that are driving a lot of the results that you'll find when people make big claims about growth is good or growth is this or growth is that. You, it's really important to start figuring out what it, like drilling down one level and seeing whether the recession years are, whether there's an asymmetry in the impact that they have on the ultimate results. And that's what you'll see in terms of well-being and that can help explain a few things. So that was one quick question. There seems to be an asymmetry between the observations that you have at the individual level, uh, but then you're taking country level growth, right? So you're taking an average in essence versus, you know, everybody isn't affected in the same way. So my neighbor maybe bought a Mercedes, 
I lost my job. And so how do you, how can you, how, how do you account for that? Yeah, so the, uh, the regression is multi-level. So it is country years. Yeah. So it'll be aggregated up, yeah. but we will use individual controls for the individual. So we, we, we will use a million individuals yeah. and for the other major data sets also a million, even two million for the BRFSS. They will u we will use individual controls for them. So in terms of education, gender, you name it, and their individual income levels. But then we will aggregate that up. So, it is, um, so eventually the, the regression results will be run on, on country year levels, I macro. So I wasn't as worried about income as I was about sort of the commensurate. So you're talking about country level growth, but what about say my salary growth, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So that would match it cleanly to you know, reported life satisfaction, which you have at the individual level. And so it, can, yeah. you match, can, you, can you identify it that cleanly? Yeah, so there's um, um, this paper kind of does what I think you're after. It's a psychological science paper in 2014 by Chris Boyce and colleagues. And they do this just for the UK, not cross country, but within the UK, they've got the, the BHPS, the British Household Panel Study. And there they look at the 10,000 individuals they've been tracking and they look at the ups and downs and look at them separately and how it relates to well-being. Right. Um, so th I think that's, that's okay. the kind of analysis that you're after. Yeah. And they find a similar. Yeah. So, we, um, so they find a similar. Um, um, so it backs up quite nicely. What we do is larger scale macro, but they do at the individual level. So the Gallup Whirlpool is one. The second one is the Eurobarometer, uh, also over a million observations. But again, we aggregate up to the country uh, year level. Here, the same thing. Essentially, GDP growth, one in, one in four, one in five, seems to actually be negative. Um, the beauty of the Eurobarometer is that it's longer term. So we get less countries, the EU 15, especially, essentially. However, we do get them uh, for since the, since the 70s, which is critical in this case because it allows us not just a great recession, but a number of ups and downs, including a number of other recessions. And then finally, the second, uh, sorry, the third data set is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, which is a massive US-based, um, but so big that we can split it up by US states and look at it by quarter and thus introduce state fixed effects, US state fixed effects, and uh, uh, quarterly fixed effects, which allows us kind of a, so all these three big data sets are relatively big and allows complementary approaches to test the exact same theory about the asymmetry in terms of how people experience uh, growth, um, whether it's US state growth in a quarter or whether it's growth in uh, a specific country. Um, so a classic empirical approach, the, the, the standard approach would be to look at growth on, uh, so take well-being on the left-hand side as a dependent variable and relate that to growth as such uh, for specific individual I in country J at time T. Um, look at growth, look, we, uh, we take the, uh, the controls or we, um, we control for a number of aspects, uh, attributes to the individual in, the, in the, uh, the matrix X. And then we have state fixed effects, uh, sorry, country fixed effects or state fixed effects of BRFSS and year and uh, quarter fixed effects as well as obviously an error term. But the, what we do here is we split the growth term up in two, and so we use a positive growth term, and when it's negative, it's, it's a zero, and then, or the, the absolute value of the negative growth years uh, that are their value, except they're uh, zero if it is a positive growth year. So that's what we do. It's, 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 I mean, obviously it gets more complex subsequently, but the intuition behind the basic result or basic model is actually very quite uh, intuitive and relatively straightforward. Um, and that's what we find. So if, if there's one thing before you all leave for the, to the Martin Sorrell talk, this is the, the basic table that I'm going to try and drill into your brains uh, forever and ever and ever, which is the simple regression with the, with the controls that I'm not showing um, between growth and well-being is positive. So people would come out from this most of the time and will say, wow, growth is good and there is, seems to be statistically significant relationship with uh, well-being. However, if you split this up and you look at the positive growth years by themselves, which is the majority of the, of, of the data, and, uh, or look at the recession years separately, you're going to be finding something a story that's very different. You're going to be finding that it's really the recession years, the negative years, that are driving the overall result. And, so, um, um, and that is quite striking. And if you, so the story then becomes growth is good. Well, the only thing you can say with some, uh, some confidence is that recessions are bad. Um, and that's a, that's a whole different story and a different interpretation. Um, um, if you look at the, the way that these, that these uh, coefficients compare to one another, you find that they kind of back up the, the kahneman fersky lab experiments with the loss aversion ratios. So I see Andrew nodding, so it kind of ranges sort of uh, just above two, 
And so in these three data sets, we find these, well, first of all, the result I just talked to you about is kind of consistent or replicated to some extent. But also the loss aversion ratios are also kind of just uh, above two and a bit beyond, but not sort of extreme either. So that means that in a, in a very simplistic interpretation, it would mean or imply that people would be willing, I mean, to, to uh, compensate people for like a 1% for loss in growth, you would almost need to give them the next year 2, 3, 4, 5% of growth the next year just to compensate the losses in well-being the previous year. So think about Greece, back, think back to Greece for a moment. So the losses that they're seeing, uh, uh, will, would, uh, it will take a few years to get them back in terms of their psychological well-being, if you will. Tepo. Sort of hung up on this, I, I think growth for whom is the big question for me, right? So we know that growth isn't equal across, across the population, and I think the assumption mm -hmm. of this model is that it is. And, that, 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 and so I'm wondering what, that impl what the implications are of unequal growth, uh, where you're assuming that it's everybody. We're all benefiting, yeah. even though we know that when growth happens, it doesn't sort of benefit everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Tepo. It feels like I've almost planted this question. Because you know, uh, the follow-up paper on this is, exactly. is top incomes <laughs> and human well-being around the world. <laughs> And so, especially given, <laughs> especially given the fact that, it's, uh, that all the growth that we've seen in the last 10 years, is, most of it has been gone to the top 1%. Yeah. And so there is a big difference. And so yes, a rise in, in inequality, top incomes, right. it depresses uh, uh, the, the rest of society quite a bit because of that relative utility and the keeping up with the Joneses that, uh, that, you, uh, that you were talking about. Peter. So is there a path dependency here um, in that you're treating negative growth the same whether the prior year was negative or yeah. whether the prior year was positive. So path dependency at all? Uh, um, so the, what I'm suggesting here in the asymmetric experience is robust to introducing the actual levels. And so I can, I can skip forward a handful of slides. Oh, well, actually, you know what, Peter, I'll do. Oh, OK. Um, and, and you'll see that the putting in the lags, so the, the levels, um, doesn't take out the effect, but it does reduce the, the overall impact quite a bit. Lags of levels or lags of, or lags of growth? Um, I, we've put in levels and then a number of other uh, macroeconomic controls. Not the lags. Because if you did lags of growth, I mean, yeah. is negative growth following other negative growth? I mean, do you get, in some sense, ignored to it? Uh, yeah. Um, it's a relatively Oh, no, no, no. There, um, there's, yeah, no, there, there will be adaptation. And so, no, now we know. Yeah. You probably expect that more with the code we did, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We did actually run it, but yes. Uh, but I'm not sure why. Right. In terms of how you split the sample, this isn't just zero one, you know, growth versus. Uh, uh, positive versus negative. Yeah, yeah negative, positive versus negative, right? Is, I mean, it's linear. Yeah. It, you know it is? Uh, no, of course it is, because, um, but uh, I, I think I know where, where you had it. So, yes. So of course this is the, if it's positive growth, then it's about zero, then it's positive, below zero is negative. But you're right, that implies a reference point at zero. But for some people, think that Chinese, if they move from 8% to 6%, it will, it will feel like minus two. If the Greeks tomorrow go to minus two from minus five, it will feel like a big jump up. And so the way we've, um, um, and so we've actually, I mean, <laughs> you guys are right into the robustness checks, uh, but, um, um, and so there are, we've been, we've been playing around with um, a number of important things. Um, it's right at the end, the reference points. And, but I'm, I'm not too sure what to think of this, but I think this gets to your question, Teppo, which is, this is what we've been looking at. So I think the Gallup data is zero is the imp implied reference point here. So positive, negative. Um, but reality, we could have these, these reference points sort of cut off at say two or three or four, for countries like high growth uh, sort of emerging markets. And so, and then we've run the same regressions and look at how the coefficients compared in terms of the ratio between them. And you find that, yeah, some, sometimes the ratio, the sort of the cutoff makes it even more sharp than, than others. But generally speaking, it doesn't look like it's that far off. So this is the Gallup, which includes all the emerging markets and mo actually is dominated by developing markets. And so you do find that as you, uh, in a way, probably goes to your points. So if you go up to about two and a half, three percent, and use that as your reference point, uh, above or below which people consider it negative, the ratio, the, the sensitivity becomes slightly more pronounced. So your intuition is probably right. OK, so that's, 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 that was meant to be at the very end. But um, up, 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 up. 
OK, so what I want to show is, so this basic table was important. I hope you got that. Uh, and you can, you can represent this by something like this. So rather than just having the linear line of growth and how it relates to, to well-being, essentially what you do, and this is the implicit point around the zero point being the reference point here, is that it kind of breaks and you find that it's not linear at all. In fact, we could put, we could put in a, 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 a quadratic and make it even more, but we found that it actually doesn't change all that much. It remains rel relatively similar. So what this shows is on the horizontal axis, growth, how sensitive are people to it in terms of well-being? Well, negative growth, so lose 5%, and you'll have a bigger drop in well-being than when you grow to 5% and how that influences uh, your well-being positively. So there's this asymmetric experience, and this looks a bit like the prospect theory kind of graphs out of, uh, out of Kahneman Thursky, but obviously this is a different story behind it and different kind of data. So we do this for the three uh, main data sets. Um, and this is where we get to our story of where we can potentially have an alternative explanation to the Eastern paradox. So not banking in on relative utility and keeping up with the Joneses, but a different story, a macroeconomic one, which is, um, so assume a, a, a typical business cycle of, for example, uh, eight years of growth at 2% on average, and then two years of recession at 2%, uh, at and then you start over and over and over again. Um, in terms of economics, that means eight years of growth, two years of losing, eight years of up again. And so even though there's volatility, generally there's a positive upward trend. But in terms of well-being, notwithstanding the fact that there's short run sort of up uh, possi uh, possibilities for going up, the fact that you are asymmetrically impacted, much more sensitive to the two years of recession, could actually take out all the gains that were there the eight years prior, right? And so hence, you essentially start back at, at, point, at point zero in this sort of stylized example uh, after, even though you, so you lose eight years, or, I mean, you lose much more in a shorter time span than you've made up in the, in the previous kind of years. And if you kind of follow that over time, then you could end up in a situation like what we're kind of seeing in the most developed nations. That is, if you consider full business cycles in the long run, you'll find that there is movement in terms of well-being, but that ultimately in the long run, you do kind of seem like there's, there doesn't seem to be much movement in the end, notwithstanding sort of major sort of uh, growth patterns, almost a doubling of the GDP uh, per capita inflation adjusted for most countries. So for example, this is what the, uh, the well-being data looks like in the EU 15. And sure, there's a lot of movement, short-term fluctuations. Some countries have a tendency to start to kind of move upward, some kind of flat, and quite a few actually start, uh, have actually come down. I haven't put GDP per capita on this, but for all of these countries, it's essentially doubled in the, the time period that I'm showing you, so since the 70s and the 80s. So, if, so, you know, hence Peter introduced me about, some people are starting to think beyond GDP, and so this is the kind of data that makes people think that way. Um, what could be driving this? So we're relatively agnostic about this, but we do have a few, um, hunches about why this could potentially be. Uh, one is, so clearly there's a loss aversion, and, but even, even folks like Kahneman and Tversky didn't get into, they, they show loss aversion in decision making, and we show loss aversion empirically, but what is really driving it? And the bit of literature around this that I think could speak to this would be uh, something about people, it goes really quite deep back into sort of evolutionary type of processes about negativity biases. We're more prone to be on the lookout for something negative than we are, uh, um, attract more attention to something negative than the equi equivalent positive. So, um, but it's difficult to really um, to get a handle on why specifically we tend to be drawn more or pay more attention to negative. Um, but it also gets reflected in the news. So there's a negativ negativity bias in the news. Economists have been quite big, uh, Nick Bloom and John Van Rien and others have been talking a lot about economic uncertainty. Um, and what we do know is that uncertainty is attention seeking. So if something is uncertain, like losses in growth and a potential loss of a job, even though you still have your job, it will be much more present and attention seeking in your head as compared to, um, as compared to a relatively stable, positive sort of setup. So, um, what we do think we've, we've been able to do with this is, at least within our niche, is to provide a novel perspective on the welfare costs of business cycles using uh, well-being data rather than the more standard macroeconomic uh, data. Uh, and then uh, is to um, really make a strong point, I hope, that anybody looking at the link between, e between GDP and growth uh, 
and well-being is to make very certain to look within and disentangle positive and negative to see what the, what the underlying data actually says. Uh, and then we were hopefully also contributing to the understanding of the longer term income happiness paradox for developed nations. Um, any, uh, any specific questions on this uh, before I get into kind of like those of the follow up robustness checks using unemployment and what have you? I wonder if, if, if the subject and well-being is if it's important. So if incomes are going up and we can't really affect it, and, and but then also there's sort of this, I mean, from the behavioral economics stuff, there's sort of this looseness. Uh, there seems to be that you think that governments, through framing and, and sort of talking about what the right reference are and things like that, that you could actually change this in some ways and say, listen, you know, look at your, you know, grandparents, you know, and us now. And I don't know. Like you think that there's some sort of tools that would help people sort of see that, you know, things aren't that bad and that governments would be using these. But the fact that it hasn't, you know, you showed all those countries, it hasn't changed, it stays the same, then maybe it just doesn't yeah. matter. Like, does, does it matter? I don't, no, it does, because, I mean, because it, uh, it does, well, there is change. I mean, look at, I mean, Denmark, there, and, and even Great Britain, like, has moved from kind of being close to three to about to close, moving into three and a half. So it is possible to sort of start, I mean, it's uh, from a scale from zero to four or one to four. So it is, it is possible. It's just that I think the, the policymakers haven't really figured it out and they're always talking about growth, 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 but engineering booms without guarding against say the, the, the troughs or, or, or engineering booms by way of helping the top 1% or engineering booms by inflating real estate versus and breaking down on something else. So I, my sense is where this is moving this agenda is taking, believing in the possibility of raising well-being but needing smarter policy that takes this into account better. So it'll, it'll then you'll have cost benefit analysis and you'll be looking at say um, two potential policies about housing or housing subsidies, but one that will generate more social capital, the other one that wouldn't. And so it'll, it'll, my sense is that policymakers will have to take into consideration more and more and evaluate policies on the basis of will they actually raise well-being rather than just efficiency and growth. Or do whatever um, Mexico is doing. Yeah, or do whatever Mexico is doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so what I want to do now is essentially just um, show you that I'm surprised. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can I just ask a question maybe about the first graph you showed on Greece? Um, because I think you're, so the, the theory is that growth impacts well being, at least subjective well being, at least in the short term, right? Yeah, um, so it, it has an impact. Right? It has an impact. So in, I think in the, in the graph uh, with Greece, it was interesting in terms of mechanism because I don't know whether you can read it that way, but it looks like subjective well-being starts to drop before GDP drops. Ah, yes, good point. So yeah. what is your, um, is that because lag, GDP is measured with a lag or how is that? No, I mean, um, I would like to think, but there, we don't have proof of this and nobody's done this properly yet, but do the well-being indicators uh, lead rather than lag uh, the, the growth, so i.e. do people anticipate uh, to some extent. Um, and so in the case of, there's one paper that tries to look at this, it's in the case of Egypt, where you find that the, the well-being indicators start dropping dramatically before the actual kind of Arab Spring and the takeover and what have you. And so there started, there's, there's an argument being built there that, so that the psychological well-being is, anticipates some of this. And I'm, I'm, but again, it's, it's an empirical question, but it hasn't been done properly. Within a business context, you could also argue that the psychological well-being of employees, employee satisfaction, engagement, would actually predict the objective sort of indicators in the firm, and say at the end of the term or at the end of the quarter. And so there's, there's work moving in that direction, but I'm not sure. But um, yeah. So you mentioned that the Arab Spring made me think of those crises of rising expectations which historians talk about mm -hmm. in terms of prompting revolutions and that would yeah. fit that. So it's, it's, it's expectations of future wealth which yeah. are driving yeah. um, and disappointment or anticipation of disappointment. Yeah. Disappointment so have a French revolution. Yeah, Richard, very good point. And actually we... Um, it's, I think it's, um, it gets to something different, but it's important for us to control for what you're saying. So what we've done is we have, um, there we go, future. So in the data, we looked at how people sort of, how optimistic they are about the future and to some extent, how hopeful they are about where they will, how satisfied they will be with their lives in five years is the question being asked. And so that gets, so to your question, just the, um, so you find just 
how impactful it is generally. It's almost even more than today's life satisfaction. So it has a direct impact on, on a, uh, sorry, so growth uh, has a lot of, so the current state of the economy has much impact on how people feel or think they will feel in five years from now. So, the, um, so there's a lot to be said there. Um, but the asymmetry kind of stays, and that's, that's why we were running this. But I think within that table sits an answer, an empirical uh, response to your question. Um, and uh, so uh, this could be of interest to the more, uh, the more sort of uh, the standard way of going after the welfare cost of, uh, of recessions and the like is by way of using consumption. And so what we've done here is um, essentially control. So do run the same thing as a basic table on which I insisted but controlling for household consumption, uh, where we find that, um, that above and beyond, um, this continues to even controlling for household consumption and movement in that in the year, the changes in growth do continue to impact in the asymmetric way that, we, that I've described uh, actual well-being. Uh, and so it, it doesn't, so it's not a replacement as such. So using well-being uh, gives you still something else that doesn't fully overlap with just looking at changes in the way people behave, the reveal preferences in terms of consumption, following positive or negative uh, growth. Okay. Um, what we, um, importantly, uh, what I want to also show is the fact this this more um, bigger table, because I'm surprised that none of you have kind of brought up, hey, but you know, recessions means loss of jobs and unemployment. You're talking about positive negative growth, but perhaps this, all of this runs through the loss of jobs. And so what we've done here is, um, We've also accounted for and controlled for unemployment rate separately, uh, and then inflation rate, uh, just in case, um, that the, the price inflation could also be something that uh, positive and negative growth impact massively, and thus well-being, uh, and the two together. And we find that it's still a growth in and of itself, above and beyond these measures, seems to be impact impacting well-being in the same asymmetric experience kind of stance and, and holds. Um, I'm kind of uh, like I'm, I've run through this quite quickly, but is there anything else that you uh, that you would be interested in finding out more, or any questions you have? No. The one thing I would still perhaps highlight about this is in the well-being field, more from the psychology side, less so from the econ side. They're starting to make a big distinction between life satisfaction, what they call, or what Karam calls the evaluative mode of your evaluating your life, versus the more affective states. How do you actually feel right now? How happy are you now? Or how worried or stressed are you now? Um, and these, this is called the affective states versus the evaluative states. And uh, the people tend to respond somewhat differently. Or um, one, and two, these different approaches on well-being relate differently to items such as income and growth and inequality. So for example, Kahneman and Deaton in a 2010 paper show that um, life evaluation, life satisfaction, the measure I've been using, is much more sensitive to the relative utility questions, the, the keeping up with the Joneses type intuition, than is your actual experience in the moment, when you're not necessarily thinking of how much does my neighbor make or what car is the other neighbor driving, right? And so what we've done here is, is to look at also the same in the Gallup data. We have measures of positive and negative affective states. How happy are you? How stressed are you? How worried are you? Um, and we look at how that relates to economic growth and economic growth split in positive and negative. And we find the same, um, we essentially find the, um, we find the same, um, the same uh, general sort of gist of, of, of the results, which is, uh, economic growth has a big impact on positive affect, uh, but split it up between negative and positive, and you, again, you find a big difference between these two. So there seems to be an asymmetric experience also in the actual experiential evaluation, uh, experiential uh, way of measuring well-being. Okay, unless, unless there's specific questions. Uh, uh, slightly off topic, but do you have a feel for the non-economic management of happiness? Uh, I'm thinking in this country, if you're Oh, your happiness coincided with the introduction of an antidepressant drugs in a, in a large way in this country and the prescription of those, or managed celebrations for countries where there's a, there's a hyping up of, of, of nationalism and that's happening in China and with, mm -hmm. in regard to economic growth. Do you have any feel for the uh, also a, a comparison of the non-economic management of happiness as opposed to the economic? It's yeah, a very good question. Um, and I don't have a good answer to it. Um, so I, I, I'd wonder, um, 
It'd be interesting to see in moments of national sort of coming together after, say, a crisis, but then sort of, um, say, I'm from Belgium, Brussels, the Brussels terrorist attacks. Would you see this, um, do you see sort of the, the country coming together around this? Would have something that you could be referring to? Would you see a spike? So it's something that the sort of the cohesion helps well-being? Or, and this is something I will be looking at soon, is do these terrorist attacks do the exact opposite? Even though you may have sort of a, a national moment, it actually impacts negatively. Um, so that's what we're starting to look at. But uh, I don't have a solid answer to, to your question. Again, you, you, you've, you've come at this from various points of view already, but, but I suppose uh, if I should have in mind, a, or if you'd like me to have in mind a cognitive model of what you're doing when you're responding to the question of what is your level of well-being, what is that cognitive process? Or, or how do you think, what is the model of how that is working and what I am addressing there? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. It's exactly the question that Kahneman, and, and Kahneman especially, has been um, telling us about. But now I ask you the question, how satisfied are you with your life? You'll evaluate your entire life situation, including the relative aspects of it. Hence, that's exactly why he's been pushing for what he calls day reconstruction methods, uh, and actual in the day uh, um, ways of trying to measure well-being as you go along, experiential, without you making uh, um, uh, sort of frames and cognitive references while you're, uh, while, while you're answering to this question. So I'm not, I'm not answering this very, very uh, so 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 solidly, but there isn't much. The experimental approaches you could take maybe in that tradition that would give you a better understanding of what subjects responding to these surveys are, mm -hmm. are anchoring on or how they're framing things or what it is in some sense so what process is operating there? Yeah. There isn't much good research. The only research that there is is tend to be slightly critical of some of these items. So for example, there, will be, there is a research paper that um, asks people the question, how happy are you or how satisfied are you with your lives? But some were given a, accidentally given a coin on, by having put that on the, on the printing machine right before they came in. They found a, a coin of like a dollar or was a, uh, something at $5, to see how that would impact their, their life satisfaction, something as fleeting as accidentally finding something. And it had quite a bit of impact. Or in survey items, um, um, I'm not, this, this wasn't Kahneman, but in survey items, how you, the question can get easily, quite easily framed. So if, for example, um, if the question before the life satisfaction question is one about are you currently, are you in a relationship? Um, and then you ask the question, how satisfied are you with your life? It will have an influence on the answer to the question. So there's, so, so there's no, I haven't seen a paper, Felix, that really gets at the underlying dynamics, sort of cognitive functioning and where your reference points are as you answer that question. But I have seen quite a bit of work trying to get at, okay, what are potential influences on that question as you're answering it? And so items such as something right before that that works well, or an anchoring question around being in a relationship or not, do seem to have a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. And hence, but the way that the literature has taken this is about being very careful then about interpreting these measures and making sure there's consistency over time. So Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, in that 2012 paper that I referred to, he goes on and on and on and on about issues with uh, the World Value Survey because halfway through, they haven't changed the question, but they have changed the ordering of the questions. And so he thinks and finds uh, that there are differences uh, as a result in the, in, the, in the way people have responded in the years following, I think, 2006, when the, the ordering has, has changed. Um, if you're unlucky, you could have huge consistency while measuring something that doesn't have external validity. Mm -hmm. so, so in some sense, consistency is great, but presumably it's not the only thing that would matter. Mm -hmm. may, I, may I relate to uh, the previous uh, question? So, so I, I, I think that you, you, you I mean, no, neoclassical economics is all about subjective evaluation. There's no, there's no concept at all of, of uh, objective evaluation in, in, in neoclassical economics. And, and there's also uh, no doubt, particularly in business, when you think about business cycle, that, that the asymmetry is there. The, the real problem is that we don't have uh, 
that, that when you look at the, at the question that Felix is asking, so what is, what is the, the magic formula that, that will tell us how people feel? The, 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 when you look at it from different direction, you get very different answers. So you, you don't have to go that far. For example, when, when you look at uh, the insurance market, the, the impression that you get is that people are, willing, are not willing to pay a lot of money for insurance, and therefore they are not that risk averse. And you look at it from the equity market, and it turns out that from that point of view, they are terribly risk averse. So, uh, so you know, this is the classic puzzle in, in, in economics, how to, how to reconcile these conflicting observations. Same here, it, it, it's very easy to say, okay, we let's write some sort of the utility function keeping up with the Joneses, and it will explain everything, but then it get, gets you absurd results on another dimension, and this is that economic growth is not is welfare undermining, particularly if it involves working harder. So, so this is really the question, that you, you can look at the problem from one dimension and fit a utility function that will, that will be consistent with that observation, but you look at it from another direction and it looks completely different. Yeah. Thank you. Any final questions? I mean, there have been lots of questions during the talk, so maybe we've tied. Then please join me again in thanking Jan for an extremely interesting talk. Thank you, Felix. <laughs>